All right, we're going to get started this morning with an invocation uh, from Pastor Mike Keebone. And then uh, how about a Pledge of Allegiance from uh, Councilman Mark Stonecipher after that. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you this morning. And Lord, I'm so thankful for these men and these women that, God, you have called and you have assigned to lead. God, I know that their jobs are oftentimes thankless. And God takes away from a lot of other things that they do. But, God, this is such an important time, such an important season, and such an important role. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with Mayor Holt and all of these men and women, Lord, as they make decisions, that, God, you would give them wisdom, you give them discernment, that they would lead us well. And, God, I pray that you would watch over their families, keep them close to you, keep them safe. And, Lord, guard them through this season. In Jesus' name, amen. I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and we have uh, a couple of listed items under Office of the Mayor and uh, one bonus item, and I'm going to uh, make my way down to the front now. Ask uh, Commissioner Willa Johnson to come forward and Debbie Martin. This is a somewhat unusual. Come join me right here. This is somewhat unusual in that uh, we're going to uh, we're going to handle a little county business here this morning at the City Council meeting. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Johnson is, of course, ending her uh, tenure, her longtime tenure as a. Uh, County Commissioner at the end of this year, but I think her heart has always been here at Oklahoma City Hall. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that she wants to do before she leaves office is honor somebody who's been very close to that heart, and that's Debbie Martin. And so we actually have a resolution here from the County Commissioners this morning that we are going to read in honor of Debbie, and I would ask the clerk to do so. Whereas Debbie Martin was born in Bluefield, West Virginia, and moved to Muskogee, Oklahoma at the age of one, where she lived on her grandparents' farm until the age of 10. Debbie graduated from El Reno High School and the University of Oklahoma with a degree in criminal justice. Debbie's first job took her to McAllister, Oklahoma, where she worked for the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. It was during this time in McAllister she met and married Mike, a Marine stationed at the McAllister Ammunition Depot. They were married 46 years until his death, and they have three children, Stormy, Michael II, and Wendy, and six grandchildren, Drew, Cameron, Will, Grace, Cade, and Ashlyn. Whereas after a brief stay at Camp Pendleton, Debbie returned home in 1971 and began work in 1972 for the Oklahoma County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council until it closed in 1985. Whereas in 1985, Debbie transitioned to the position of business manager for the Community Development Department for the City of Oklahoma City. It was shortly after, in 1987, that Debbie was assigned to the City Council Office by the City Manager, Terry Childers. Whereas in 1988, Debbie was promoted to City Council Chief of Staff the position she still holds with the City of Oklahoma City. In this position, Debbie has worked on numerous projects, including the development of the Oklahoma City Youth Council, the North OKC Soccer School, and numerous other projects having a direct impact on the lives of the citizens of Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County. Whereas during her tenure as City Council Chief of Staff, Debbie has worked and served over 40 council members and 10 city managers. Whereas, in addition to her work at the City of Oklahoma City, Debbie has a passion for serving others through various other civic groups and supporting outreach efforts that impact the lives of all Oklahoma County residents. Whereas, among the many notable outreach efforts Debbie supports is the Metropolitan First Tea Program. 
Debbie was integral in the founding of this program in 2003 and remains a driving force in the first T's efforts to impact the lives of young people by providing learning facilities and educational programs that promote character development and life enhancing values through the game of golf. Whereas the Oklahoma County Board of County Commissioners takes great pride in recognizing individuals whose hard work and dedication to serving all citizens of Oklahoma County. And whereas Debbie Martin has dedicated her life to serving others for more than 50 years and is worthy of recognition and a well-deserved thank you for her efforts to make Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County a better place for all people. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Oklahoma County hereby congratulate and thank Debbie Martin for years of dedicated public service to the people of Oklahoma County. Be it further resolved that the Oklahoma County Board of Commissioners does hereby declare Monday December 3rd as Debbie Martin Day in Oklahoma County. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. So that was yesterday. How did you spend Debbie Martin Day? <laughs> uh, Commissioner, would you like to say a few words? Just a few. I, I couldn't retire without doing something for this woman. She is, she's just an awesome person, but she made me who I am. Uh, I didn't know how to do anything. I just had lots of ideas. And she was the second person in my life that knew how to read my mind and get things done. And we got a lot of things done for Ward 7 that had never been done before and some that haven't been done since. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate this council. Some of my, my buddies are here, so I, I love you much, but I'm, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> January the 2nd. I hope around 10.45 a.m. <laughs> but I, I simply couldn't leave without honoring this woman. Thank very you good. very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> Debbie, despite appearances, you are not retiring. But uh, would you like to say anything? Well, I'm just truly privileged to do what I do every day. Um, I hope I lead my day with a servant's heart and just and I hope I touch someone and make a difference in someone's life each day. And I have a great family, great counsel. Um, I love doing what I do. I tell our youth counsel, don't go to a job for a job's sake. Go to something you love, because then it's never a job. It's never about going. But I couldn't do what I do every day without city staff. And there's a lot of staff that support me and this council every day. And I love her, too. Thank you. Let's hear it for Debbie and Commissioner Johnson. All right. Why don't we have uh, if Sherry Gately would come forward. Sherry, you are, pending the results of this resolution, our Teacher of the Month uh, for December 2018. Let's learn a little bit more about you, if the clerk would please read. Whereas Sherry Gately has been named Teacher of the Month for December 2018 by the Putnam City Public Schools Foundation and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Whereas Sherry is in her eighth year teaching and serves as the English Department Chair. And whereas, during her tenure at Putnam City West High School, Sherry has grown the Advanced Placement English courses enrollment from 30 to 160 students. Sherry proudly serves on her school's Title I Committee and Guiding Coalition. She also serves on State Superintendent's Teacher Advisory Board and University of Oklahoma Education Professors Division Advisory Board. Whereas Sherry is a recipient of the Putnam City Schools Foundation's YES grant to attend a design thinking conference at Stanford University. 
Whereas Sherry was recognized in 2018 as Teacher of the Year by Putnam City West High School, Putnam City School District, and as a 2019 Oklahoma State Department of Education Teacher of the Year finalist. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Sherry Gately on her selection as the December 2018 Teacher of the Month by the Putnam City Public Schools Foundation and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Thank you, Francis. Well, um, we are very grateful for all that you do, and you're obviously very accomplished. Um, before you say a few words, I think we'll maybe go ahead and take this vote. I think we know, we know enough to do so. Um, we have a patriot here, uh, Councilman James Griner. Would you like to make the motion? All right, we've got a motion and a second. Why don't you cast your votes? Passes unanimously, you are the Teacher of the Month, Sherry Gately. Um, my father was also a Putnam City Schools English teacher, and he can talk for hours. So I think you'll have no trouble saying a few words this morning. Uh, and you might also introduce the folks who have joined you from Putnam City today. Um, well, I am also a patriot, so if you can handle standing next to a patriot as a panther. Um, first of all, I am here with our superintendent, Dr. Fred Rhodes, my wonderful supportive husband, um, Joshua Gately, a principal, Dr. Jason Mimoli, and the head of our Putnam City um, Schools Foundation, Jennifer Seal. So those are the people who are with me today. Um, being a teacher in Oklahoma kind of has two layers of difficulty, um, but I truly have the best job in the world. Um, every day I get to help inspire students to kind of change the trajectory of their lives. And um, just to share a quick story, yesterday I had a student who will not only be the first in her family to graduate high school, um, but received a full ride scholarship to the University of Chicago. So she's going to graduate high school as valedictorian and received a full ride um, at a prestigious university. So that is what I get to do every single day. I work with immigrant students and um, students who haven't necessarily had the best um, lot in life. And we work hard and we change um, the dynamics of our future, which can potentially change their families for generations to come. So I am truly blessed to do that. And thank you so much for this honor. Thank you. Let's hear it for Sherry. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now let's bring Stephen up here, Stephen Fuller. Stephen, let's move aside the podium here. Stephen, you are, again, pending the results of this resolution, our employee of the month. And uh, we would like to learn a little bit more about you, so why don't we start there, if the clerk would please read this resolution. Whereas Stephen Fuller is a Municipal Accountant 3 in the Payroll Division of the Finance Department. Whereas Stephen Fuller's duties include database development, query support, testing coordination for Kronos, Kronos training, and development and assisting his supervisor. Stephen wears many different hats and continues to deliver exceptional customer service to both internal and external customers listening to their concern and working hard to resolve their problems. Whereas Stephen is a problem solver and always looking for more efficient ways to complete tasks for the payroll office. Whereas Stephen is currently finishing a new payroll database which has taken two years to develop and has already cut, cut processing time significantly. Whereas Stephen consistently finds ways to implement new technology to improve efficiency. Stephen has previously been named employee of the quarter twice for the finance department for his payroll innovations and saving the city half a million dollars on the retro module. Whereas Stephen has also received two special recognition awards for his work on the Kronos 8.0 upgrade and was named ASD employee of the month twice. Whereas this council desires to recognize Stephen Fuller for his dedication, professionalism, and commitment to the residents of the city of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Stephen Fuller, December 2018, South Oklahoma City, Kiwanis Club employee of the month. Thank you, Francis. Um, we think we have the best city employees in the country, and we love this uh, monthly opportunity to recognize one of them. And you sound like you are 
definitely one of our shining lights, and we very much appreciate you, Stephen. And in that regards, that's my pitch for passage of this resolution. And so uh, I would entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second. Uh, cast your votes. Passes unanimously, and you are the employee of the month. Congratulations, Stephen. Uh, Zach Nash in the PIO office was taking our picture earlier and considers you the person who ensures that he gets paid. And so he, he, you are among his favorite employees. Um, would you like to say a few words? Sure. I just want to say that working in the finance department has been one of the most rewarding pieces of my life, and working in payroll. We, are, we have the privilege to touch every employee in the city, and it's really a rewarding experience every two weeks. You always know what the end product of your hard work is, and I'm here with my supervisor, Don Thurman. Without her, we wouldn't be where we are, and the assistant director, um, or actually acting director now of finance, Kenny Soodle. So this is very special to see a transition of finance where we have Craig, who I've looked to for leadership for so long, is now acting city manager. So this is a very exciting time to work for finance in the city. So. Well, you guys do a great job. Let's hear it for Stephen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. All right. I'll make my way back to my seat. And for those of you who are here for this stuff, you are welcome to leave. You don't have to stay. All right, that concludes the items from the office of the mayor today. That brings us to the Journal of Council Proceedings uh, on page one of your agenda, printed agenda, items 4A and B. We can handle those with one motion. Uh, we've got a motion and a second. And there were a couple typos. Did we get those yes, addressed? and I have new ones to distribute. Okay, but all right. They'll be approved December 18th. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, it said that our meetings had ended in the middle of the night, and I thought it only felt that way, but it didn't, I, I, it didn't I, actually I, happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, we've got now item five, request for uncontested continuances. Mr. Freeman. Yes, sir. So we have several items here. Uh, first of all, there's a request to strike item 6C as a revocable permit uh, due to the weather they were going to this was the uh, sand ridge santa run and they're going to cancel that due to the weather that's that's uh, projected for this weekend uh, next item is item 9e and that's a request for deferral and this is on pud 1687 and again that's item 9e under 9k1 we have several items that are, we have requests for them to strike, and so it uh, starts with 9K1A, 8501 South Kamei Avenue. Request is to strike this. Uh, owner is secured. Item, item 9K1J is 3815 Northwest 10th Street. Again, uh, request to strike. The owner is secured. Item 9K1K, 3028 Northwest 14th. Uh, it's owner occupied now. Item 9K1Z, 9821 Southeast 43rd Street, uh, we need to renotify. Item 9K1AF, 927 Northwest 100th Street, is owner secured. Item 9L1A is 8501 Kim A Avenue, and the request is a strike because owner is secured. Um, looks like so same thing on 9l1j 3815 northwest 10th street to strike the owner is secured item 9l1k 3028 northwest 14th street is now occupied item 9lk i'm sorry 9l1x 9821 southeast 43rd street is to strike due to uh, need to renotify and then 9L1AA927 Northwest 100th Street to strike its owner secured. Those are all the items. All right. 
Thank you, Mr. Freeman. That brings us to item six, revocable permits. Item 6A is a revocable permit with the Arts Council of Oklahoma City, Inc. to hold opening night and the opening night finale 5K, December 31st and January 1st in Bicentennial Park. And it looks like we have Seth Lewis has signed up. And Peter, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Great. I'm Peter DeLisi. I'm Director of Arts Council of Oklahoma City, and I've got Seth Lewis <coughs> with me. Uh, sorry to hear about the uh, Santa Run being canceled this weekend. And uh, we just made a quick decision that what we'll do is if, if the uh, DOKC Inc. will give us their uh, run, run people, participants, we'll take that list and for every runner who wanted to run in the Santa Run, we will donate $5 for each of those runners who decide to run in the finale 5K on New Year's Eve. So we'll donate to DOKC Inc. $5 for everyone who uh, had to miss that run. I'm one of those people that will be missing that run. Uh, we're, uh, we're sorry to see that. The 33rd annual uh, opening night. It's really amazing, and we're, we're so excited to be in front of you to talk about this. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention my personal excitement, and Seth as well. The modern streetcar will be open on New Year's Eve, running until 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's going to be free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is a this is a game changer for opening night. People that are in Bricktown having dinner will be able to jump on the streetcar, run right over to the event, or wherever it is that you're parked, you'll be able to zip around. You can come and see the fireworks display, go back to your parties. It's, it's really changing the face of, of downtown Oklahoma City in some pretty dramatic and outstanding ways, which I mean, it's going to take a while for all the layers of that to really sink in. But we're one of the first big events that gets to uh, be a uh, one of the recipients of, of that exciting new project. So we're really, really happy about that. Uh, uh, last thing I'd like to say is thank you so much to uh, all the departments within the city. Uh, and it's, it's so nice to see uh, Mr. Freeman up here this morning. A wonderful job that all of your employees do. It's just fantastic. We get so much support from many, many different departments to make opening night happen, especially the countdown to midnight and shutting down the streets and the fireworks display. We really, really do appreciate that. And I'm going to be handing out some uh, wristbands to everyone, but I'd like to introduce Seth. He'll tell you a little bit more about the event. Good morning. Um, so uh, the co-chairs, Kent Stephen Myers, Rachel Crawford, and countless volunteers, and I've been working since June to plan this. It's our 33rd annual, and this year we have nine stages. We've included the Freedy Theater at the Civic Center Music Hall to add that um, to our venues, and Lyric Theater, we'll be doing a Broadway review with 10 of the local actors uh, to open up the like, horizon of the theater to um, our city. Uh, we have also the Oklahoma City Philharmonic. We have or Orchestra de Calle at the library. We're at the Museum of Art. We have a, magi a ma magician here in Council Chambers and Ali Loren downstairs in the lobby. So we've really worked hard to make sure we have a community um, event that is diverse to everyone in the community and welcoming. Um, our finale is free to the public we just sell wristbands for the rest of the venues. And we have a great band called Take Cover, which is a 10-piece um, performance band, which will lead us into midnight in our wonderful firework display. So I think it's going to be a great thing for the city that uh, we can continue as our 33rd year. And we're really looking forward to seeing what the crowd can bring out and great weather as well. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Councilwoman Salyer? Yes, I certainly would make a motion to approve and hope everybody will come down. It's a great evening. We've got a motion and a second. Any questions for the team here? Comments? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have Thank a great all. event. We're excited. Thanks. I'll be around. Yes, ma'am. If I may thank Peter and the Arts Council for their generous donation. I really appreciate it. <laughs> We're sorry we need to do this, but weather precludes oh, the, a safe uh, event. So uh, the that's always right. our priority. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, item 6B, uh, revocable permit with Oklahoma City Events and Entertainment to hold the Holiday River Parade on December 16th in the Boathouse District. And uh, I do believe Mike McAuliffe is here to speak on that item. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Thanks for your time. Uh, it's not our 33rd year, but sometimes the weather uh, the past few years we've done this, it seems like it's been 33 years we've done the River Parade, but it actually started on uh, 
in 2004 to officially open the river as the last MAPS project to be completed and dedicated. So that's when we started the river parade. Uh, this year it takes place December 16th at 6 o'clock p.m. It is a free family holiday event. Um, we are honored to uh, first, uh, at the theme of the parade this year, celebrating 25 years of MAPS since the, uh, that's how our parade started, was completing uh, the river and celebrating the completion of the river and the MAPS 1, uh, the MAPS 1 vote. Uh, our city manager, uh, Jim Couch, will serve as our grand marshal because as most of you know, he's spent 25 years working on MAPS and uh, we're honored to have him as our grand marshal. Uh, as Peter was saying, uh, we do appreciate the work of the staff. We appreciate the city's support, uh, the Riverfront Authority's support, uh, support from parks, police, fire, and uh, public works that help us pull off the river parade. Um, in fact, one year we had to break up the ice so we could get the boats down the, the river. So we, we called the uh, barge Icebreaker 1, and, uh, and that boat continues to be in the parade every year. But just quickly, I want to thank some of our uh, key sponsors, including the City of Oklahoma City and the Riverfront Authority, uh, the Chickasaw Nation, SSM St. Anthony's, OG&E, David Sports Center, and uh, boat entries. Uh, there's no entry to, to uh, there's no entry fee to be in the parade. Um, you can go to OKCParade.com to enter your enter your boat and be a part of the parade. But there's more than just the parade. We also bring in a show from uh, Florida. Uh, professional skiers uh, that put on about a 30 minute show under the lights of the Oklahoma River, uh, dressed as elves and uh, put on a great show. All these performers have performed at Cypress Gardens and the different places there in Florida. And then we have the uh, escort of Santa in and then we'll have a fireworks show, uh, about a 10 minute fireworks show to, for our finale. But again, Mayor, Council, thanks for your support. Uh, I'll see if I've got one more in me, but uh, we're definitely going to get this one done this year. But again, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Nice? I must say, I have been uh, a couple years back, so I will say please come and enjoy, and let's move the item. All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any further questions for Mike or any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Have a great, have a great parade. All right, item 6C was previously struck. We will now recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. Uh, we've got items A, B, C, and D. Um, I do believe that Councilwoman Nice wanted to make a few comments about item A. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to say we are excited about what is to come for Ward 7 as far as the Douglas Park enhancements. And that is what we will be talking about as far as uh, promoting the health, wellness, and enhanced quality of life with over 60,000 square feet to replace the existing recreation center. So this is very uh, momentous for Ward 7 and uh, the Douglas area of Northeast Oklahoma City. And we are excited for what is to come. And thank you to the voters of Oklahoma City for that geo bond. Great. Uh, I don't have a motion if anyone wants to make it. Second. Got motion and a second for all the items as a group. Any other comments on any of them? Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Uh, we just have claims and payroll, but we'll go ahead and vote on it anyways. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We will adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we have three items. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust and reconvene as the council, uh, where we find ourselves on page three of the printed agenda, item seven, the consent docket. And We've got a motion and a second, uh, subject to individual consideration. I know we have a presentation for item L, and is there anything else that a council member would like to pull out or discuss? I, uh, I just need to pull out W to vote on that separately. You want to vote on that separately? Yes. Okay. Understood. And Mayor, I'd yep. like to uh, comment on 7L and 7R. L and R. L and R. Okay. 
Mayor, I'd like to comment on 7W and 7AD, please. Okay, anything else? All right, we'll take them in order. That means we'll start with the presentation on item L. Mr. Freeman, you want to introduce our speaker? So Aubrey McDermott is our planning director. We'll be speaking on this item. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Aubrey McDermott, planning director. Um, what's before you today is a request for proposals to advertise for a consultant, a professional uh, consultant, to help us carry forward our initiative to update our city's development codes and subdivision regulations. The impetus for this was when we adopted our comprehensive plan in 2015. The plan made multiple recommendations to go back and look at our requirements in our municipal zoning ordinance and our subdivision regulations to help us implement more efficient growth and comply with the policies of our comprehensive plan. So the purpose of this effort is that we can improve efficiency and outcomes for development and that we can make the development process easier to navigate and administer. So last year, we hired a consultant to go in and do a diagnosis of our plans recommendations against our city's codes. We started with a public process to work with people who use our codes to give us feedback on barriers that they felt like they faced in trying to do quality development and things that might need to be looked at and explored again in our codes and ordinances. They identified several things in our codes that made it difficult or ineffective to get the type of development um, done that they were intending to do these days. Um, identified a few things about how the overuse of our uh, planned unit developments and site-specific plan approvals requires people to go in and do specific types of zoning because our base zoning districts are um, too narrow and sometimes too broad. So therefore, it forces people to have to go into these negotiated planned unit developments. Many cities of our size have had this exact same situation happen where um, they've realized that they need to adapt to a different, more flexible type of code, and cities of our size have done this process and, and um, seen really great results over the past decade for us to look back on. So the second phase is to hire a consultant to take the recommendations from the first um, consultant phase, carry that forward through extensive outreach and citizen engagement. And this process is probably going to take about four years because Unraveling the code and looking at the subdivision regulations is a really extensive, difficult, complicated process. We're going to have a lot of community involvement in this process. We are going to come up with some strategies to help implement this so that it doesn't impact our development community or our city staff. And this consultant will help us devise that strategy and the rollout um, plan. So this contract is going to allow us to hire a professional consultant team and then annually review the contract, and it allows for renewal up to four years so that that consultant might be retained throughout the process towards implementation. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Right, well, Mayor, I just would comment, uh, the reason I wanted to pull it out was so that I could commend the planning department for taking this next step. You know, we know that Plan OKC has been recognized nationally, um, but it, it is really complicated to implement. And so I appreciate you taking this extra level of attention to coordinate our ordinances and regs with the plan to make it even more effective than it is. Thanks very much. Okay. Any other comments on this item? All right, we'll move on. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, item R, Councilwoman Salyer, you wanted to talk about that? Uh, thank you, Mayor, very much. I just, this is a, um, we, we did a small streetscape about a year ago um, that we're accepting the project and placing the bond into effect. Um, and it, it's the small strip of Western that runs between Northwest 18th and Northwest 23rd Street. It's been a great project. It's very well received by the neighbors. It's uh, I think really helped enhance the experience um, in and around uh, the area, but we're having a little bit of trouble with maintenance. And I don't know if there's anybody to speak to that. Um, I, I, my recollection was, Eric, that we had some agreements with some of the property owners originally to help us maintain, and there has been a turnover in some of that ownership. I didn't know if that had an impact. 
So yes, this section of Western Avenue from 18th to 23rd, we had some tentative agreements with the adjacent property owners that just didn't come to fruition. So we weren't able to present those to the city council. Um, we did work very closely with the parks department to make sure that the landscaping that's included in that streetscape is easily maintained. It's got a lot of, uh, of native grasses, um, trees, and some things that aren't going to require a lot of maintenance, but our parks department are going to be assisting in that maintenance moving forward. Um, but right now we're in the mode of being able to final accept that project today, which is going to officially transfer that, that maintenance from the contractor to the city. So today will be that day upon council approval. But in this transition period, it was just looking a little rugged. Yes. So. Thank you. Just, just so that you heard what he said, it has not been accepted. So we worked with the contractor all summer to keep the weeds and grasses down, but it has not been our responsibility up to this point to maintain it, but it will be clean going forward. Okay. Item W is not a part of the motion that was made earlier. We're going to hold that out uh, for, for a separate vote and comment at that time. Um, so moving past that, we've got item A, B. Councilman Stonecipher, you wanted to talk about that? Thank you, Your Honor. I, I have to honestly say I think this is the first time I've ever spoken about a lagoon closure bid. Um, but um, this is really important in that this is the beginning of improvements of the C.B. Cameron uh, soccer fields, which will be uh, improving and expanding soccer for all the kids in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's, it's a first step. It's a big step. Uh, and uh, we hope everything goes well uh, as far as the lagoon, lagoon closure uh, as it occurs. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. That concludes the items I had on my list. Uh, did any, anything else anyone wants to talk about? All right. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the items except for, these are all the items under the consent docket except for item W. Anything else? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 7W, uh, and Councilman Stonecipher, you wanted to discuss that. Yes, again, thank you, Your Honor. This is an access roadway and traffic improvement agreement with PACOM. Uh, the reason we're doing this, in part, is because PACOM, uh, according to Fortune Magazine, ranks number five in the United States as a fastest growing company. It's one of the five fastest growing tech companies in the United States. Since 2014, it has grown from 90,000 square feet to 250,000 square feet. And most importantly, Paycom is hiring. And uh, so we want to work with them and come up with uh, improved traffic flow and better safety in and around the facility. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Well, now uh, I would entertain a motion on that item. Move the item. OK. We've got a motion and a second for 7W. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, that concludes the consent docket. Brings us to page 10 on your printed agenda. Item 8, the concurrence docket. And we've got uh, items A through I, and I would entertain a motion. Move the items. Got a motion? Second. And a second. Any discussion on anything here? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item nine, items requiring separate votes. Um, and we'll start with some planning cases. We've got several items under A. These are ordinances on, on final hearing that were recommended for approval at the Planning Commission. We have A1, which is at 3705 North Meridian Avenue, going from SPUD 7 to O2 General Office District. Councilman Greiner. Yeah, this uh, this got this staff approval and planning planning commission approval. Has anybody signed up? It looks like we do have the applicant, Annie Miller Edge. The, ap the applicant. Is, okay. Um, well, if there's no questions, I'll move for approval. Okay. All right. No comments. No questions. We've got a motion and a second. We'll cast our votes. Passes unanimously. All right. That brings us to item A two. This is at 6601 East Britain Road, moving from uh, AA to PUD 1680. Councilwoman Nice. I understand we had one protester for this item, but uh, they were not at the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, so let's move the item. Okay. 
Second. We've got a motion and a second. We, ha we have someone who has signed up to speak, and so I would offer that opportunity to Sally Henderson. Ms. Henderson, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address. I'm Sally Henderson, and I, my, my address is 6701 East Britain Road. I'm the neighbor immediately east of the property in question. I signed up just in case I needed to say something, so I'd rather hear what was going on before I say any more. Okay. Well, I don't know if anyone's making a presentation. I think we were about to vote, so. Oh, are you wanting to? <laughs> okay. Good morning. David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Uh, here today on behalf of the applicant as well as with Mr. Tim Johnson. Um, this is a PUD that would take uh, this, this 80 acres from AA to a PUD that would allow 30,000 square foot lots. Um, this is an application that we spent considerable amount of time on. Um, initially, staff requested that we go and see if we can't bring sewer to the site. Under the comprehensive plan, this is designated under ULI. So we spent a lot of time with the property owner to the west. It's a very complicated path by which we would have to bring sewer here. And ultimately, we were not able to get an agreement in place where we would actually be able to bring sewer. So during the process, we did have an opportunity to meet with uh, the protester, we explain what we're doing compared to perhaps what could be done in the future if sewer does get here. Uh, as you might imagine, it's a significant increase in density from what we propose on the 80 acres. We propose 80 lots. Uh, as an accommodation to her, you will notice in the memo provided to you, uh, we did ask the Planning Commission and they did agree to strike uh, one of the TEs, TE1D. Staff had initially asked us to connect to the east. Um, the individual that came and just spoke was very adamant that she did not want a connection to the east. So uh, as a means to accommodate her, we did agree to not have any connection to the east and Planning Commission did agree to that. One of the problems we believe that the uh, protester has had is the previous developer that developed the land north uh, perhaps did not do a good job with trash and with the lots that they sold. She had uh, a lot of problems from what we understand with people throwing trash over the fence. Uh, again, as an accommodation, our client agreed to uh, fence the entire eastern side of this. Uh, so it, it was our hope that those accommodations would uh, satisfy her or at least put this in a better position understanding that this is prime development land and it will be developed. So we do believe we have come up with the, the necessary accommodations to make this as palatable as possible uh, to her and I believe that is, is reflected in Planning Commission's unanimous recommendation for approval. And we'd be happy to address any questions the Council might have. Any questions? Seeing none, we do have a motion and a second. Uh, Ma'am, did you wish to speak after having had the presentation? No, okay. Well, very good. Uh, is there any further discussion on the item? Um, seeing none, we'll vote. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, we're at item 9A3. This is at 1233 Northeast 6th, moving from R2 to SPUD 1070, uh, 1077. Councilwoman Nice. Uh, for this one, we had no protesters for this, so uh, unless we have someone to speak, we can move the item. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9A4 at 4538 South May, going from C3 to SPUD 1078. Councilwoman Salyer. So th uh, this uh, location is down at Southwest uh, 44th and May. Um, it is... Um, uh, creating an SPUD to permit a food truck um, within the uh, former, I think it was called the Reading Shopping Center. There were no protests at planning, and I would move approval. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9A5, uh, 3441 Northwest 50th from R1 to SPUD 1079. Councilman Shadid. Anyone sign up to speak? No. Said no protest. Unanimous planning commission approval. I move for approval. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9A6, this is at 10709 North Rockwell, moving from SPUD 1033 to SPUD 1081. Uh, Councilman Greiner. Yeah, this, uh, this spud is to permit a hair salon. It had uh, planning commission approval. Uh, has anybody signed up? I'll, I'll move for approval. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. 
Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9B, 1 and 2. Um, this is, uh, the first is an amendment to the Master Divine Design Statement. Of course, this is relating to item B2, which is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval uh, at 715 Northwest 64th, going from O2 to I2. Um, Councilman Shadid, there is someone who has signed up to speak. Would we like to hear from John McKee? Mr. McKee, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address. I, I filed a, a protest, and most of what I've got to say is in that written document. So I'm, I'm here to answer questions, and I borrowed some earphones from you. So I hope I can hear if any of you have. I would point out and on your agenda, it says it's uh, from O2 and I2 Industrial. It's from a, a PUD 1653, which is shown on the map. And it is not from uh, Light Industrial, and it's not from uh, and an office, well, the, the PUD 1653 is office, but the zoning is PUD 1653, is what I'm trying to point out. Uh, uh, briefly, I, we feel like it's office and uh, retail and possibly uh, residential. And it is not light industrial any longer. It used to be 20 years ago. Everything was I light, I light. We look at it like, say, Midtown, like your Midtown edition. It's got some I-2 left in it. It's, it's got some I-2. But, but it, it, it is... Uh, this zoning is not residential, this zoning is not office, and this zoning is not retail. And those are the three principal uh, uh, uses presently and certainly in the future. I have read the ordinance and uh, it, it specifically states that spuds are for planned areas, planned areas. The other problem we have, if I can be brief, uh, is uh, the design statement tells nothing. It just as well not even be there. The design statement uh, does not direct any uh, 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 requirement for water. It doesn't direct any requirement for drainage. And it certainly does not direct any requirement for a public street that runs approximately 800 feet along the south border. It's on the map. Northwest 64th Street. With this zoning, which is personal storage, uh, the, uh, uh, as near as I can tell, the city does not, uh, is not going to make any requirement, certainly on the street. Um, if it were office, there would be a requirement for sure. If it were residential, certainly. And if it were uh, retail, certainly. What's to do with the street? What's to do with the drainage? What's to do with the uh, uh, water? Got to have water. Even personal unit, personal storage units have to have water. They have to have it for sanitation purposes. 
they have to have it for, uh, uh, well, there's a, there's a plant. There's a plant requirement. They've got to have it for landscaping. They've got to have it for fire hydrants. They need a street for emergency vehicles, if not just uh, uh, maintenance and uh, normal uses. We use the street now, even though it is not improved. We have the property directly south of it. We, all, we go on to 63rd, which is lots of access. But we also use 64th. I'll shut up now and see if anybody has a question. I don't think I have that much time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Councilman Shadid? Is he up? Yeah. Good morning, once again, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, so, briefly, this, this SPUD is partially covering what was approved by Council uh, last December in the PUD 1653. Uh, this is a Rand Elliott designed personal storage facility. Mr. Elliott is here uh, to, to present uh, in a moment, but I, I'd like to talk briefly about where we are and, and why we're here today. Um, it, it's worth pointing out that my client had multiple conversations with the individual that just came and spoke before you. Uh, back at the planning commission phase, he was represented by counsel, Mr. Kelly Work. And it became clear to us that the real thrust of the protest was they wanted my client to pay to improve 64th Street all the way to their property. Now, it's worth pointing out that their property is right here. It fronts on 63rd. They have direct access to 63rd. My client's access to this personal storage facility is at a point where 64th is already improved. The purpose of this exhibit is to show you that. We don't need 64th Street improved. If they wanted to pay to go do it, we would certainly support them in that effort. But it wouldn't benefit my client. It's not needed. Public Works commented on it at the Planning Commission meeting. Planning Commission was unanimous in the recommendation for approval. Staff recommends approval. It was a fairly lengthy discussion at Planning Commission. And at the end of the lengthy discussion, one of the Planning Commission members asked Mr. Work, what is it that you want? Give us some details of what it is you want this applicant to agree to. Mr. Work stood up at this podium and said, we want a 15-foot building setback line from what 64th is, the, where the right-of-way is, my client stood up and said, we agree. They then said, we want a 10-foot landscape buffer within that 15 feet with specifics as to trees, the size, and the, the width at which they'll be planted. We stood up and agreed to do two-inch caliper medium trees on 40-foot centers. Throughout this entire process, every specific item as it relates to the substance of this SPUD, my client has agreed and conceded on. What they simply cannot agree to is to build a street for this individual. It is worth noting that this is an industrial area. If you've been driven through this, and you'll see it on the screen before you, there is straight I-1 in the area. The R-1 that exists are remnants. I would submit that those areas will never be developed residentially. The big void on the eastern side of that map is the railroad tracks, which is part of the reason why we believe, and Planning Commission agreed with us, that personal storage at this location made some sense. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Elliott briefly to go through his, um, a few of his slides. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Because he brought up water, that this area is fully served by... We, yes, we will connect to water. And so all of our landscape will have to meet the city ordinance as it relates to irrigation. Um, in terms of drainage, we'll have to meet the city ordinance as it relates to drainage. All that is spelled out within the document. Um, so we will comply with all city regulations. What I would submit is that compared to PUD 1653, the only thing that this SPUD does is add the one use for the personal storage, and it adds a significant amount of landscaping and other details that weren't provided in 1653. The reason being, now we have focused in on the actual development that will occur here, so we're able to provide those details. So I would submit that this is typically how the council would want this process to work as we get closer to actual developed land. So, you, so you'll take a minimum 12-inch water line 
extended into the property off of our six inch line. Yeah, whatever the whatever city engineering requires us to do, we will do. Okay. Absolutely. Dave, excuse me, David. Is that an active rail line to the east? Yes. Okay. Rand Elliott, uh, 425 Northwest 15th Street. Good morning. Thank you for your time, uh, Councilman Shudi. Um, we are here to just uh, talk about the opportunity to reinvent what personal storage really means. Uh, we have a very um, thoughtful uh, client in this particular entrance, interest, and um, the decision was to do the finest and best personal storage that's ever been done. And so that's what our goal has been. This is across the street from the to the north from the Chesapeake campus, which we did, and so we are trying to adhere to a white metal panel uh, architectural feature that would be consistent with that, uh, therefore consistent with the neighborhood. So the first image is actually from 64th Street looking to the east. Um, you see a really beautiful sign design. The concept is called contents, and the idea is that that is obviously what goes on in this particular area. The first uh, visual connection that you have is the office, which is a glass um, space that would encourage you uh, and invite you to come and use the facilities next. Um, this is a drawing that just simply talks about the size of the signage element and shows you a little bit more about the easterly view. Next. Um, to the left, you're seeing that the proposal, of course, is to do landscaping. Um, we have on the end of each one of the uh, building units a lighted graphic uh, that is an artistic feature that represents the fact that what goes on inside those buildings is contents. And so they have various and sundry shapes to represent what might be on the inside. Next. Um, we're doing um, some really interesting features, uh, whether it's um, corner guards or integrated um, uh, guttering. We're really trying to deal with the details that are generally not seen or not uh, uh, given consideration in other uh, personal storage buildings. So this is the idea of making all the details really make this a very high quality project. Next. Um, you can see the graphics. Each one of the units is um, identified. Um, we've obviously done uh, site proof requirements around the perimeter. Next. Um, and then at night for security, um, all of the graphic elements light so that you can see which particular building you're using. It's also there uh, to be able to have uh, an artistic quality to it as opposed to just a typical personal storage which has no considerations of this kind. Uh, a view again, you can see the graphics. And one of the things that's particularly important through our studies is the idea of security and really quality lighting. And so we're illustrating that that would be done uh, here people use these um, kinds of facilities on a 24-hour basis. And so we've tried to take all the details that are typically not designed in personal storage and done an exceptional job of uh, correcting it, if you will. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Rand. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I do also want to mention that our initial application, it actually traversed and came down south uh, of 64th Street. Uh, that was one of the first conversations my client had with the protester. Uh, and so we removed that element from our application to, to get away from them uh, as an accommodation so that everything we have now lies north of the 64th Street right away. So again, staff recommends approval. You, planning Commission was unanimous. i uh, be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. Is there anyone from staff in either development or planning that can opine? Do you, do you have any thoughts or how, how this went at Planning Commission or? Uh, pretty much like he said, I watched it again yesterday before the meeting today. Um, and they negotiated about the landscaping. Um, I think the app, the protester asked for trees on 20 foot centers, four inch caliper. The Planning Commission felt that the two inch 40 foot separation was adequate. Uh, there was also a, press, a protester to the north that he was concerned about screening. They put stockade fence, and they're going to use the building screening there. Uh, the rest of it's pretty much uh, we recommended approval, felt like it is a reasonable use of the property. Um, part of the re issue here is there's not really availability of sewer east of that office building, and so you don't need the sewer for, for the mini storage. But the Planning Commission was, uh, they were all supportive of it. Okay. 
And no, no additional concerns by the Planning Commission that haven't been addressed? No, they, they addressed everything that they talked about. Okay. I move for approval. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. My approval, i make one comment. Sure, sure, come forward. Come to the mic. This uh, plan, design plan, does not tell you the number of buildings, does not tell you the square footage, does not tell you the size of a building. What's it for? There's never been a plan that did not tell you the size of a building or how many buildings. Okay, I mean, thank you. Where's the plan? <laughs> thank you. Okay, could we move um, B1, the amendment first? Sure. Now, I'm just to that, I mean, I'm assuming that the SPUD limits uh, utilization to storage, correct? To his point. The, uh, the SPUD is PUD 1653, which was approved, and it added this use. Added this use. Right, the mini storage use. Okay. All right, so moving uh, B1. The amendment first. Okay. Second. All right, we've got a motion and a second on the amendment, B1, 9B1. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. And moving B2, please. Okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second on 9B2, the ordinance on final hearing. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes, passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we have 9C. This is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval. It is closing 280 feet of an alley between Northwest 5th and 6th, east of the railroad. Councilwoman Sire. Yes, Mayor, thank you very much. Um, as you mentioned, this is a uh, closing of 280 feet of an alley to consolidate some property uh, just where the railroad bridge is at uh, 6th and off of just east of Broadway. Um, there were no protesters. Uh, it, this was recommended for approval, and I would move that we approve it. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9D, ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval. This is a special permit to operate a drinking establishment sit-down uh, in the DTD2 downtown transitional district at 814 West Sheridan. Um, Councilwoman Salyer, we do have someone who has signed up to speak, the applicant, it appears. Yeah. Kevin Pham. Great. Philip, why don't you come tell us a little bit about the project, because this is exciting. If you wouldn't mind saying your name and address. Good morning. Kevin Pham, uh, 814 West Sheridan, uh, for the applicant. Uh, we're excited uh, to add an additional uh, drinking establishment in the uh, district. Uh, we're directly um, south of the new apartment complex and to the Jones. Um, we're requesting uh, the uh, rezoning for the special permit. This is certainly a really busy part of town. It is right across the street from Jones Assembly and a series of new uh, ventures happening uh, on Sheridan and Film Road. Um, there were no protests uh, at Planning Commission. I would move approval. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, item 9E was deferred at the beginning of the meeting, which brings us to 9F, ordinance on final hearing, removing metered parking on the south side of Park Avenue, uh, et cetera. Councilwoman Salyer. Uh, thank you. This is related to the uh, development of First National Center, and it was a recommendation from the uh, fire marshal's office to remove the parking metered spaces and uh, create a no parking any time zone in that space. I would move approval. We've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, now we're at 9G. This is the second of three council meetings at which this item will be considered. This is merely the public hearing regarding ordinance relating to schedule of fees, amending Chapter 60 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code, Code Title II, etc. Is there anyone here who would wish, wishes to speak on the public hearing portion of this consideration of this item? Seeing none, we'll move on to 9H. This is the first of three meetings uh, for this ordinance. Uh, it is to be introduced today, set for a public hearing December 18th, 
final adoption January 2nd relating to taxation. And I believe, Mr. Freeman, we have a... Uh, yes, uh, Bob Ponkilla, our city treasurer, is going to speak on this. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, as uh, City Manager designee uh, Freeman had indicated, I'll be speaking about 9-H today. Uh, it's an uh, annual fee on uh, investor-owned utilities and rural electric cooperatives. Uh, for our discussion today, I'll just uh, refer to these as RECs. Uh, my comments will be very brief. Uh, back in 2009, some legislation was passed to allow, um, allow for the expansion of more providers for electric service. Uh, the legislature's intent was to uh, allow for a more, uh, I guess, organized approach to this, making it more cost effective for consumers. One of the gist of the legislation actually addressed the areas that might be annexed by the city. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, in those areas, in the event that there were more than, uh, you know, more than one uh, service provider in an area, then the service providers could negotiate a split of the customers within that area. Uh, if everything worked out right, they would take that split to the Corporation Commission, and the Corporation Commission would approve that split. Another allowance within the legislation was to provide for the municipality to uh, enact a annual fee uh, on the service providers. Now, the language within the uh, legislation is a little bit convoluted, it's a little complicated, but basically what it comes down to is that uh, the intent was for uh, a fairness factor, meaning using our example, say we had an area that we had annexed, uh, the negotiation had taken, had taken place, uh, and the customers were split. Uh, the intent was for the, if say one of those providers was a franchised uh, provider, at that point in time, the franchisee was paying a 3% franchise fee on its gross receipts, but it was also collecting a 3.875% uh, sales tax from its residential customers. The RECs in this situation, if there's, that was the other service provider, they would be only collecting or paying the city a 2% uh, gross receipts tax. Uh, they were exempt and still are exempt from collecting sales tax from their residential customers. The intent of the legislation was to make that more fair between the franchisees and the non-franchisees. So at that point in time, the city implemented a, or passed an ordinance to establish an annual fee for the RECs. Uh, again, they were paying 2% at that point in time. We established a fee at 4.875. So that way the RECs will be paying the same amount to the city as a franchised service providers. As you're all aware, earlier this year, the city sales tax rate was increased by a quarter percent. Uh, as such, uh, what we're requesting is that we were allowed to go ahead and increase the uh, annual fee on RECs in order to keep us in compliance with state statutes. So that's an overview of the request, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. How many service provi providers do we have like this, and what will the uh, revenue increase, how, what, what dollar amount, what are we talking about? I don't know the exact amount of the providers, but the estimated dollar amount is about 75000 a year. All right. Any other questions for Bob? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We will need a motion to introduce that ordinance. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to page 14 on your printed agenda, item 9I1, public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures uh, that are listed here, A through L. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on any of these items? Seeing none, we've got a motion and a second on 9I2, resolution that declaring the structures are dilapidated. Um, is there any discussion? 
Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we're at 9J1. This is a public hearing regarding a dilapidated structure in an HP district. Uh, one item there, 416 Northeast 15th. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak under the public hearing portion? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for 9J2, the resolution declaring that the structure is in fact dilapidated. Move the item. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Well, now we're at 9K1. This is the public hearing regarding the unsecured structures listed here, uh, except for the items that were um, deferred or struck at the beginning uh, of our meeting. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on any of these items between A and AE? Seeing none, uh, I'd entertain a motion for 9K2, the resolution declaring the structures unsecured. Move the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This brings us to 9L1, public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings listed here, save the ones that were struck at the beginning of the meeting. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak uh, under the public hearing portion regarding items B through Z? Seeing none, uh, I would entertain a motion for the passage of the resolution L12. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. This brings us to 9M. This is a resolution approving amendments to the City of Oklahoma City Housing Programs Policy for Loan and Grant Programs funded by HUD. And I believe, Mr. Freeman, we have a presentation on this? Um, yes. From Daryl Lawson. Lawson from the Planning Department. Good morning. Uh, some of the uh, Changes that we're wanting to make are mainly for uh, uh, clarifying and non-substantive changes, um, such as uh, not being able to go through our programs but once every 10 years, or allowing them to go through once every, every 10 years, uh, allowing uh, disability, disabled people to qualify through Social Security versus a doctor, makes it a little easier for them to prove their disability for five years. Um, relaxing some of the uh, uh, policies on the SNI program, uh, such as uh, a five-year forgivable note versus a 10-year. We're trying to increase the participation in the SNI areas. Um, also adds language that if a loan or grant is or uh, forgiven that they receive an IRS 1099 form. Uh, we'd like to raise our minimum payments to $100 from 75 on our general repayment loans. Uh, we're also uh, making some changes, like to make some changes on the S&I HEMP program, making it a grant versus a forgivable loan. Again, trying to increase participation in the S&I areas. Um, deleting the uh, policies for the DR program, that, pro that um, program is over. We've already exhausted all the funds. Um, and then some uh, other policy changes to streamline our uh, bidding of the projects to help us complete them timely so our funds don't expire. Um, adding for um, Increased number of progress payments for projects over $80,000. Um, and then just uh, also some reasons uh, for contractor disbarment from the program for inadequate behavior. Um, and then also there's a, uh, a typo, removing self-closing devices on windows, which there is none. So we just need to remove it from the policies. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Daryl? All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd entertain a motion uh, on the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9 in 1, resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of Daniels v. City of Oklahoma City. I believe we do not need executive session. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
901, resolution authorizing Richard Smith, Sherry Katz, Thomas Tucker to represent and defend city employees William City et al. Uh, in the case of Brewer v. City of OKC. I don't believe we need executive session. Nope. We've got a motion and a second on the resolution. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. That brings us to 9P1, claim recommended for denial. Uh, one item here, 1A, Progressive Insurance Company. I don't believe we need executive session. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then that brings us to 10A1, claims recommended for approval. I don't believe we need executive session. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on the claims recommended for approval? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, that brings us to item 11, items from council. We'll start down here, Councilman Stonecipher. Oh, I am very, thank you, Francis. We had a extra item added to the agenda. Hold those thoughts, Councilman Stonecipher. Let's move back to, uh, well, it just is what it is. It's not really categorized on the agenda. It's an extra item. It was noticed properly, Francis. Yes. Just wasn't a part of the, of the first agenda. Um, this is extra item, items one and two. Public hearing is first. For, let me state what the public hearing is about. Uh, item two is a joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust approving the allocation of general obligation limited tax proceeds and or investment proceeds in an amount of $250,000 to provide for certain job creation economic development incentives with Booz Allen Hamilton Inc., et cetera. I do believe we had a presentation on this uh, at a previous meeting. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak in the public hearing portion uh, in consideration of extra item two? Seeing none, uh, we have the joint resolution for consideration. Okay, we've got a motion and a second on the extra item two, joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we are back, sorry for that. Uh, we are back at items from Council, Councilman Stuntsoffer. Thank you, Your Honor. Just briefly, I want to thank uh, Jackie Owens from the uh, Summerfield Homeowners Association and Brian Ferguson from the Quail Creek Homeowners Association for coming down last week uh, for an early meeting as we begin uh, discussions on how to improve and expand the CB Cameron soccer fields. Thank you. Great. Councilwoman Nice. Thank you. I do want to say that we had a great time at the Bricktown Tree Lighting Festival on mm -hmm. November 23rd. Mm -hmm. So thank you to Mayor and all the young people that <laughs> lit the tree. And also uh, happening in Bricktown, water taxi free rides. Take advantage uh, <laughs> Thursdays through Sundays. And I do want to make mention of a couple things that are happening in Ward 7. Uh, we have on this Saturday the first uh, AME church. They're having their 12th annual Christmas Bazaar fashion show. And the reason I bring it up is because there will be a luncheon. And uh, we will have speakers from the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber to speak about the benefits of entrepreneurship and how it relates to Ward 7. And on Monday, we will have our developers forum part two. And we will have uh, that at Metro Tech from 6 to 7.30 and we will have the planning director, Aubrey McDermott, as well as Kathy O'Connor speaking, uh, the president of the Alliance for Economic Development of Oklahoma City. And also I want to make mention of our teacher that we had that we're honoring. Uh, she has a Young Women Lead uh, program that she has with her school, and tomorrow I'll be speaking to the, those young people, so it's an exciting time in Oklahoma City as well as to honor a teacher that's uh, encouraging young women to lead in Oklahoma. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was privileged to attend along with Mayor um, the menorah lighting ceremony re representing the first day of Hanukkah uh, on Sunday. And so I just want to uh, wish all of our viewers a very happy Hanukkah season. Your Honor, a couple of weeks ago we went through an interview process to find uh, the new city manager, and we had both internal and external candidates. Uh, personally, I thought every person that we interviewed was very impressive and uh, presented themselves very well, had some great ideas. And uh, one thing that struck me, though, during the uh, process of interviewing these various candidates, and by the way, I think it speaks very well for Mr. Freeman to be selected above all those candidates. Uh, with respect to the external candidates, 
they had some issues that are going on in their communities that I think we are facing or will be facing. And I hope we can uh, take advantage of the experience that's been uh, obtained from some of those other communities as we begin to address some of those issues. And on top of that, I'd like to see if we could possibly, if we were able to actually go and visit some of those communities, see if we could bring uh, representatives from our state legislature from both houses that represents the city of Oklahoma City, as well as somebody from the governor's staff, because I think they'll have a better idea as to the issues that are unique to a large uh, municipality like us in Tulsa. And if they saw firsthand what could be done to address some of these issues, perhaps they'd be more supportive of us uh, because it's, it never hurts to have as much help on some of these issues as possible and perhaps even bring some of the uh, representatives from uh, Oklahoma County and the other counties uh, that the city uh, district uh, includes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the Windsor Hills Neighborhood Association Group uh, is uh, sponsoring, in conjunction with the Windsor Hills Shopping Center, uh, an event this Sunday afternoon from 1 to 3. Uh, participants can come up and enjoy and f learn what's going on as far as celebrating Christmas and other cultures. Uh, the movie theater has also scheduled a free showing of the Polar Express at 3 o'clock. So I invite everybody with uh, small kids and uh, people who are interested in looking for an afternoon of entertainment and education to come to Windsor Hills Shopping Center, again, starting 1 to 3 this Sunday afternoon. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. That brings us to item 12, City Manager Reports. Mr. Freeman. Yes, periodically we'll bring forward on the council priorities the, um, some of the departments will come and present um, the part of their plan that they, part of the, that they contribute to those priorities, addressing those priorities of the council. This is one that's actually been bumped a couple of times. We had it on the schedule. And so today we're going to have Aubrey McDermott's going to start, off, start us off um, talking about plant from the planning department, Eric Winger, and then uh, we'll have Jason Fairbrush. This is talking about the council's priority on the transportation system that works for all residents. Aubrey. Good morning again, Mayor and Council. I'd like to kick us off today on your annual update on your council priority for developing a transportation system that works for all residents. Um, last year, Jason Fairbrush gave a very quick presentation at the Mayor's Development Roundtable that I wanted to just briefly show you because I, I want to remind us about what components go into creating a transportation system. And transportation systems, in terms of a, a planner's perspective, they're the bones that support our city's social and economic fabric. Land use and transportation have such an intrinsic tie to each other. The investment in our transportation system is so important for guiding our growth. And when we look at Oklahoma City's transportation system, it's not just our streets. It's not just automobiles. We have a pedestrian network. That's an essential part of our transportation system. Right now, Oklahoma City has about 2,500 uh, miles of existing sidewalks. We've been investing in sidewalk infrastructure for the past decade through our MAPS programs and, again, through our geo bond and our extended sales tax. So with our 2017 um, Better Street Safer City program, 2017 Geo Bond, and the extended sales tax program will be building an estimated additional 110 miles of sidewalks across Oklahoma City. Also, our bicycle and trail infrastructure in Oklahoma City is an important component of how to get people to their jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, and as a source of recreation and to get people to amenities. So our existing system of bicycle infrastructure, which includes bike routes and lanes and trails, is about 248 miles. We're going to be building probably around 88 additional miles through the Better Street Safer City program. And then, of course, our streets, which are a very important priority to our community. But as we have an opportunity to improve our streets, either through resurfacings or other types of streetscape investments, we can update our street infrastructure to support what goes on in terms of land use and the needs and the traffic that has been changing um, as our city's growing. 
So we have funded additional street improvements through the Better uh, Street Safer City. This map shows the areas that the 2007 bond and the 2017 bond and sales tax program will be either resurfacing or modifying those streets. So as a big challenge to Oklahoma City being 620 square miles, maintaining the infrastructure across our city is also a very big challenge to us. And you can see that we're making good strides in keeping up with uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, there's our transit system. So a transit system is a very important component in helping people get where they need to go without relying on an automobile. And for a city of our size, I think this is a pretty uh, significant investment, pretty impressive that we have 23 routes covering 240 square miles of our city. A lot of cities themselves are around 240 square miles. So for our transit system to stretch that far is a, is a great thing. And we're still building on that. What's interesting about looking toward the future, too, is that 70% of millennials use multiple ways of getting around the city or a suburb. This trend is not a trend that's going to be going away. We are building a transportation system not only for our current populations, but for changing demographics and for our future. And then we have a new addition to our transportation system that is going to be coming online this month, our new streetcar. Uh, Streetcars serve as a great circulator for getting people distributed across our downtown to enjoy our downtown. It's going to be a great economic development catalyst and tool that's going to help sustain the viability of our downtown for many generations. And it has 22 stops throughout the downtown connecting people to different districts along about 4.8 miles of track. So when you look at our transportation system that way, this really is what the heart of our city council priority is about, is developing a transportation system that provides different options and modes and abilities for people to get around Oklahoma City. So what I'm going to do is just set up and remind you of the, the uh, council priority statement that you have. And then um, following me will be Jason Fairbrush and Eric Winger. They're going to be reporting on the measures that you've established for this council priority to see how we're doing, how we're building our transportation system over time. And of course, I, I know you all realize that this is a multi-departmental effort. We have many departments contributing to this goal of coming up with a transportation system that gets people where they need to go in a timely manner through various means of providing various means of mobility. And in terms of the planning department, um, we do have a transportation planning program. So we are charged with kind of looking at the long-term big picture of our transportation system. Therefore, we are doing plans. We do studies. We help generate reports. We help make recommendations for capital uh, project recommendations and investments. So we work very closely with the other city departments in helping implement some of those strategies and ideas. So your council priority says that we'd like to improve the condition of our streets and that we'd like to make Oklahoma City more pedestrian and cyclist friendly. You have several progress indicators that we will be reporting on for that. In terms of the planning department's contribution to this, we uh, adopted our first pedestrian bicycle master plan this last year. This is a long range guide for where bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure would best accommodate the users of those systems. And we've been using this plan to help guide our Better Street Safer City sales tax investments. The council priority statement also says that the transportation system needs to get people where they need to go in a timely manner, accommodating various means of mobility, and that we need to pay attention to new developments in transportation over time. And Jason Fairbrush will be giving us a report on our commute times, or I think maybe Eric is going to cover that piece of it. Um, in terms of how the comprehensive plan guides this is that we've adopted a livable streets policy in our comprehensive plan, which allows the city to look at streets as the city grows to um, target certain types of improvements that can support land use. So anytime we have a budgeted capital improvement project, we reference how the street could be improved with different types of livable streets features, which would mean maybe on-street parking, maybe a bike lane, it's just an opportunity as we do a resurfacing project or a restriping or a street enhancement project that we're building that street to support the community and our businesses. And then also, um, there's a growing interest in improving public transportation across our city and working on regional solutions and funding. So we'll be reporting on those progress indicators and know that several city departments do work on the regional uh, transportation 
program with a lot of different partners, uh, the planning department and uh, public transportation and parking Embark work very closely with different entities. We work with ODOT on any types of grants, federal grants that we might get, and the Association of Central Oklahoma Government and their multiple committees. So that's just an overview of the planning department's role in this, and I'm going to hand this off to Eric Winger to take you through some of your other indicators. Aubrey, before you do, uh, just a comment, I, and perhaps you've already addressed this with the planning commission, but in an effort to increase the use of bicycles, especially in the downtown area, there is a potential problem of a lack of a storage place where once you arrive downtown, where you can uh, store your bicycle. Some parking garages have a small area, but it certainly is limited in its size, and, and it wasn't truly designed for bicycles or just kind of forcing it as an afterthought. So going forward, if the Planning Commission can keep that in mind with any new developments, that they do provide uh, a certain amount of space for the storage of bicycles, and for example, with the uh, new parking garage that will soon be uh, begin uh, being constructed, make sure that there's adequate storage space for bicycles there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't hear you. How many additional miles of biking lanes are planned? Um, Was it? That slide includes trails as well. I'm going to go look in my notes and see if I can find that. Um, bike lanes, additional miles. I don't have the miles. I have the funding source for on-street bicycle lanes that we have 17 you tell me later. million. That's fine. Thank and you. I can get you a number. Just one quick comment. Uh, I really appreciate what y'all are doing here. And I, I think it's fantastic work. But when we're looking at a presentation that talks about developing a transportation system that works for all of our residents, could we please not obscure about the eastern half of Ward 4? in the slides. Thanks. I, I have a, one of the slides talks about paying attention to technological advances like autonomous vehicles. And, um, it seems like if there's a department that has to, to look at the 10, 20 year view, it's, it's your department. And to David's point, there's, there's all kinds of things happening in cities across the country and in other countries. So. Yeah. My, my hope is that we don't function in a vacuum and just utilize our Oklahoma City experience, but attend national meetings, reach out to other organizations. There's a whole streetcar organization that has all the different cities that have streetcars. Uh, we've, we've attended Railvolution, uh, different city employees. But I guess the question is, what, what national meetings would the planning department at our are attending, and what, what do you think we might be able to attend? Um, our, our profession has a lot of focus on this right now. We, at the National APA has very focused sessions learning about the future of cities and how autonomous vehicles might impact cities over the long term. And um, this, I, every year I attend the Big City Planning Directors Institute in Harvard, at Harvard. Um, where the 30 largest cities in the United States planning directors come together. And those cities, you know, as uh, Councilman Greenwell had mentioned, have learned a lot of lessons and are, are ahead of us in many, many ways and struggling with lots of problems that we are not there yet. Right. But all these cities are very focused on how transportation can impact growth and, and efficiency and success of those cities. So we are very much involved in these discussions on a large-scale um, national kind of forum we have multiple agencies, you know, ULI and other types of institutes that offer education, training. Um, so we are very much involved in that. Great. Thank you. Okay. And Eric Winger is going to take us to the next section. Thank you, Mary and Council. So we've got several of the prog progress indicators that Aubrey mentioned that are specific to public works. And then Jason Fairbrush is going to present many of those that are related specifically to transit and embark. Um, so as we move forward, um, we have actually three indicators that are here on the screen. The first is the, the number of residents satisfied with the condition of city streets, the number of miles of trails and sidewalks constructed, and then the average commute time. So you'll find these each in that 
plan. Um, looking at the percent of residents that are satisfied with the condition of city streets, this is something that we have really wrestled for, for many, many years. And as many will recall, we were really faced with just the projects that were included in the 2007 bond issue. Um, so we continued to watch these numbers decline, even though we continued to do a number of, of new street projects across the city. So you'll see the data here back to 2014. There's two major indicators, major streets and neighborhood streets, but you'll see both were declining until this past year in 2018 where we actually saw the first uptick in some time. I think that's probably partially due to the 2007 bond issue starting to wind down and the fact that we've actually pushed out a number of not just street widening projects but street resurfacing projects. I would also expect as this indicator is tracked in 2019 and going forward, especially with the Better Streets Safer City initiative, combination of additional 2017 bond program and a 2017 sales tax program both where they're highly focused on those residential surveys and needs for improving city streets, that this number is going to increase. And so we're anxious a little bit to get that data for this upcoming year, um, but I hope to be able to report here in the following year that we've seen another increase in citizen satisfaction, um, and we'll start making those goals on what those numbers should be moving forward into the future. One of the indicators that we look for, the condition of city streets, and we've talked about this number quite a bit. This is the pavement condition index, or the PCI number. Again, to remind everyone, it's a scale of 0 to 100, with 100 being it's a brand new street and 0 being it's the worst street or, or basically a non-existent street. But we show that uh, as we set a target of 70 for that, for that pavement condition index as an average goal for Oklahoma City, that we are making strides in getting there. Now, it's been about one point per year. Um, but again, as we've now ramped into um, implementing the 2017 bond and the 2017 sales tax programs, we believe we hopefully will be able to gain more than just a point a year. This also combined with the fact that there's fewer widening type projects, more resurfacings, we're improving those conditions of some of the city's worst streets citywide. So work that's underway citywide in all wards are those streets that have those low PCI numbers that are in the teens and the tens and some that are um, even single digit. Um, so those are coming back up to scores of 90 to 100 very quickly um, moving this forward. Something that we're starting to work on, and I'm going to kind of pause and kind of go through these slowly, but we're starting to track PCI and color citywide. So this is a citywide map, all 620 um, plus square miles. Um, colors that are green, generally those are streets that are in good condition. Those that are in that more red color, those are the streets that are in the worst condition. Yellow is somewhere in the middle. Um, but as we go from 2014 and we look at some of the progress that we've made, um, you're going to see a little bit of a change as we go into 2015, as we go into 2016, there's a lot more green that is now starting to replace some of those red and some of those other less colors. Um, as we come into 17, now you're going to see there's a continued yellow that's kind of on this drawing, and I would tell you that that's generally our average. Um, generally, the most streets that uh, we're addressing now and as we follow those criteria that have been established for better streets are the streets with the highest traffic, the streets with the lowest PCI, but we're also starting to look at streets that have um, accident sever severity issues where we can actually track that now in our GIS. We're also able to track the number of work orders. And so we're able to actually enhance that system a little bit better so that we make sure that we're trying to get to those streets our residents want us to do first, not eliminating any streets from the system, but just trying to put a prioritization together so we can get those worst streets fixed most efficiently. As we come into 2018, um, again, you're starting to see more and more green um, on this drawing, and, uh, and we would expect that as we'd be able to create this for you in future years, um, that we're going to see a lot less red and a lot more improved conditions citywide. We look at a transportation system that works for all residents and the number of miles of street improvements. So this number is something that we tracked, and again, when we were focused in the 20. Um, 07 program, there were a lot of widenings in 2012 and 2013, which is why our miles of street improvements were, were lower. Um, we're now averaging more than about 50 miles of street improvement a year. That number is also going to be going up slightly with the sales tax program. So as we report on 2019 and 2020, we're going to see a small bump in the number of street miles that we're able to get out. But long term, the bond issue, which is a 10-year bond issue, is going to continue to maintain that level of street improvement going forward well into the next decade for Oklahoma City. This is the GEO bond and the sales tax streets, and this is what we're starting to show in 2018. So when I, when I mentioned uh, the number of expenditures, and this is our, our millions of dollars expended on streets a year, 
The new green bar that you see stacked on top of the blue bar, which is the bond, is showing that we're starting to increase the amount of money that is now going out for just street improvements. And so um, this fiscal year 2018, um, we are expecting to see some of the highest dollars spent on street in recent years, and we'll see that continue to improve in 2019 and 2020 as well. I think this was a question that was asked um, of uh, Aubrey when she was presenting, and this is the number of miles of trails and sidewalks constructed, and these are yearly totals. Um, you'll see back to 2013, 19, but you can also see that when we brought uh, trails online in 2014, you're starting to see that combination. 2017 was a big year because it included a lot of the MAPS 3 work um, regarding trails and sidewalks. Um, in 2018, it slightly decreased. Um, that's only because a lot of the MAPS 3 work is now completing. Um, but we are getting ready to see that go back up again with the Better Street Sales Tax Initiatives because we have additional trails and additional sidewalks that are planned very specific to just that program. And so I expect in 2019 this number to increase yet again. When we look at the trails location map, the trails are identified in green. We also have bike lanes as another mode of transportation that are starting to be shown um, on this map as well that are identified in gold. And so you're going to continue to see as we implement um, Plan OKC and Bike Walk OKC specifically, starting to enhance that bicycle, that trail. And again, Aubrey showed a slide on the sidewalk networks that are, that are being added to citywide. This is that sidewalk location map, but to be more specific, the reason for all the different colors on this map is to show all those different funding sources that the city has committed um, to improving sidewalks. Those that you see in the blue color, those are from the 2007 bond issue. It also includes a lot of the residential sidewalks that have been constructed in neighborhoods throughout the city. Uh, when we look at um, uh, colors like the, the gold, um, those are again some 2007 uh, bonds as well. Um, predominantly for the resurfacing on our arterial streets. MAPS 3 is also in dark blue. But then we have some fund balance sidewalks and some other categories of sidewalks that have come online. Again, I think the purpose of the map is to show that we're developing a system that is a citywide system as much as possible, providing for connectivity um, from north to south, east to west. So the last update that I have is on our average commute time. Um, and this is, uh, this is an indicator that uh, the resources and the data actually come externally from the Census Bureau. Um, but something that I think I would like to point out is we're really, I think, well managed from a traffic perspective of maintaining an average commute time of 20 minutes. Um, and that's a number we've reported clear back to 2010. Now, yes, there's been a slight increase in our commute time, but when you compare that to the population increase that we've seen and we've been able to maintain that commute time, um, we think that that's actually a very good indicator, that our commute time has not dramatically decreased, and we've been able to maintain that either through the city's intelligent traffic system, either through advanced planning and making sure that we're providing street projects and transportation projects in the, in the areas, especially where our commuters are seeing. But again, we report this just as a part of one of those priority indicators um, requested by the city council. Eric, is this per trip or per day? These are just your average commutes per day, I believe, from the, from the survey. So, we can check on that to be sure, but I believe these are. OK, so it'd be 40 minutes total in a day. Okay. So with that, I can answer any questions you might have about the public works portion. Again, the indicators, and we're very focused on streets, but we're very focused also on implementing Plan OKC with the Better Street Safer City Initiative that also include bicycles, trails, and sidewalks, as well as multimodal city that we're very quickly becoming. I want to just ask you about <clears throat> the data and modeling for the future and how, if you, if you have a street, let's say you have a new street or you, you, you fix a street so your PCI is almost 100, are there variables you can plug in like vehicles per day, uh, area of the city, and you can model how long it would be until you'd have to repair that street again? So there are, and we actually have recently purchased some new software um, for payment management specifically that helps us forecast payment conditions and future needs for capital improvement projects. I think one of the biggest changes that we've had with Better Streets in this new computer software is that we have a lot more tools to use other than just a PCI or just a traffic count. Um, one of the other things that we've actually been able to enhance this past year too is where we used to only rank streets or rate them in the PCI every other year. And we're now doing that annually with equipment that was purchased by Public Works where we drive every street so we know its condition more regularly and up to date. But yes, we actually can forecast that now with some computer software and our GIS system, kind of the rate of deterioration. The fact that we're actually collecting the data more regularly, we can kind of graph its performance over time. 
Um, but it's allowing us to hopefully fix the worst streets first, where I hope that maybe in the next few short years we're actually getting into advanced maintenance of good condition streets, making sure that they don't deteriorate further. But you'd be able eventually, if not now, model for future councils how much it would cost to keep a PCI. I mean, it, we're getting, we've invested quite a bit and we're getting small bumps six, from 64, 65, 66. But to get to a 70, to get to a 75, like what kind of investment you'd have to make? I think once we are able to utilize this new software and to look at some of the other data in the GIS, yes, I believe we probably can do that in this next year is to kind of start beginning to make those predictions. Would, um, that, would that be able to predict both capital investments needed and then what that would cost in terms of maintenance during the year? I, I do believe it has the option to include both, yes. So one of the things I think as we talk about maintenance, you know, we have reported previously that we average 80,000 pothole repairs a year. Right. The other thing that we'd like to start trending, now it's not a priority indicator, but something we expect to see whether aside is that the potholes should start decreasing with the improvement of streets. So as we fix those worst streets that are the ones that are repaired with the most potholes, we should see the pothole numbers also start to decline as an indicator as well. So we're actually starting to track that even though it's not something that is being presented this morning. So there's a lot of data, and we're starting to take advantage of a lot of that going forward. Thank you. Yeah. Any additional questions? Thank you. Um, Jason Fairbrush is going to present now on the transit portion of uh, the uh, transportation system. We'll have uh, comments from citizens uh, right after this, so you'll have that opportunity. Thank you. Okay, well, good morning, Mayor and Council. And um, as um, Public Works Director and Planning Director mentioned, I'm going to share um, information specific to public transit with you this morning and how it relates to our Council priorities. Um, as, we, as we get started, we actually have three priority indicators uh, that we track within the Public Transportation and Parking Department um, that, that tie to developing a transportation system that works for all residents. Um, the first one there is public transportation ridership, and we measure that a lot of ways internally, but for uh, this reporting purpose, we look at riders per service hour. That's generally the best way to measure ridership from an efficiency standpoint and allowing us to compare ridership when there's any changes in service hours, which equates to changes in service. Um, we also look at the number of bus service hours, and this is a direct tie to our frequency. And as we've worked over the last few years to improve our frequency, um, we know that frequent transit service um, is paramount to a robust uh, public transit network. So the more service hours we have, the more uh, frequency we can offer. And then we'll look at where our average frequency is. So starting with um, uh, first slide here on riders per service hour, um, we have a target of 18.5. And I will say that's a stretch goal that's consistent with the philosophy of leading for results where departments are asked to set those goals that uh, do make you, you know, reach or stretch. Uh, they're basically meaningful targets. Um, you can see that looking through um, the last five years, FY14 all the way through FY18, our riders per service hour has been anywhere from 18 to just under 17 uh, is where we finished in FY18. And then um, looking at the green bar graph, that will give you an idea of how that riders per service hour translates to average riders per day. And again, um, in FY18, we finished at 10,312 trips per day. That's looking just at our Monday through Friday weekday service. Um, certainly um, higher than when we started our enhancements back in FY14, but has tapered off a bit since our peak in FY16. Now to give you a sense of what that ridership in FY18 um, is cumulatively, that's about two, it's actually over 2.9 million passenger trips just on our Monday through Friday service. Of course, if you um, add in all of our services, we're well over 3 million trips provided uh, to Oklahoma City customers during the fiscal year. So. The next slide here is one that um, we have, I don't think we've shared this one with council before. Um, this kind of looks at our ridership levels by route. And one of the things I'd like to mention and share is that um, we are tracking metrics on each individual route 
uh, in more detail than we, we really have in the past. We look at anything from on-time performance for each route to revenue miles for each route, and of course ridership per service hour for each route. So I thought it might be interesting, and if we look at our really just 20 of our um, local uh, city routes, um, we have four of those routes that uh, for FY18 finished above target. We have five that we would consider to be on target, and then we have 11 that are below target. So it's about half and half as far as meeting or exceeding target. Um, but I'd like to direct your attention to the right-hand uh, portion of the slide. And if you look at our top four routes, the riders per service hour actually averages about 25. Our best performing route is Route 9, and we get uh, about 32 riders per service hour on that route. Um, <clears throat> then if you look at... Jason, I'm sorry, what is Route 9? Uh, route... With where we are. Yeah, Route 9 is uh, basically uh, Main Street and Reno um, out to the west. It's one we actually uh, just it, it recently... It stops at the Walmart, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. the one that stops at the Walmart on Reno and in yes. between Rockwell and MacArthur? Yeah. Oh, is it the one that goes all the way out to the Outlet Mall? Yes, it's, it's, it's one that, it's one that okay. uh, transfers out there at our uh, uh, mini hub at mm -hmm. uh, Greenfield Center Place, right? Okay. Almost, almost to the Outlet Mall. And are you going to share with us what the other three... Oh, yes, I can. Uh, I sure can. So uh, as far as top performing routes, uh, Route 2 at uh, just, uh, well, 26 uh, riders per service hour. And, and where they are, Route oh, 2 is okay, well. I, don't, so, I don't know yeah. them as well as you do. Yeah. No, no, and so, so Route 2 basically serves um, the northeast uh, Oklahoma City. Um, it's uh, 13th, I believe, and, uh, and then uh, part of uh, 23rd Street out in that area. Um, Route 7 is basically... Um, uh, a portion of May Avenue, that's uh, 21 riders per service hour. And then right, Route 38 is basically 10th Street, and that's uh, 22 riders per service hour. So, um, And then if you look at, um, if you look kind of the other end of the spectrum, and you look at uh, what is our riders per service hour if we dropped our, our four bottom performing routes, then you see overall our average is just under 18, really not too far uh, from what our stretch goal is. And so I would like to mention that, you know, um, just because we've identified four routes kind of at the bottom of the list in terms of performance, by no means are we looking to get rid of those routes or reallocate those resources. I mean, the very nature, as you know, of public transportation is there are times when you have bus routes in areas that don't necessarily make, you know, they're not necessarily as efficient as others, but because of community needs, we keep the service out there, much like we do with uh, bus shelters. You know, as we work to install new bus shelters, we have all of our stops prioritized in terms of boardings. We try to work through and put those new shelters where we, ha where we have the most boardings, but there's always occasions where it makes sense to deviate from that. Let's say if we're, you know, in front of a medical facility or a, or a senior facility, we may have a shelter uh, there just because the boardings, even though the boardings don't necessarily stack up with some other areas. So anyway, again, just a, I, th I thought it might be an interesting uh, way to share with Council some of the individual performance of the routes. And then this next slide here uh, is looking at our uh, nighttime service. And our nighttime bus service, where you saw our daytime service kind of stabilize and taper off just a little bit, our nighttime service actually continues to grow. It is our best performing um, uh, bus service that we have currently. Um, you can see in FY18 we finished at 8.4 riders per service hour compared to 7.75 the previous year. Um, if you look at the graph you'll get a sense of the cumulative number of trips we provide each month. Um, in FY18 the blue line there so we had a high of about 10,000, a low of about 6,000 cumulatively. And that dip you see in the cooler months is just, I mean, that's just kind of a natural trend with public transit ridership as the weather gets colder and, and isn't uh, as, uh, as nice, uh, ridership typically declines. Um, if you look at, uh, and keep in mind our night service is really four routes. We did add a fifth route beginning in FY19. But we provided uh, over 96,000 trips with those four routes um, running at night in FY18. And then, uh, let's see, looking at the next slide here, 
This is actually a snapshot of our service hours. So we still have our riders per service hour that we saw in, in an earlier slide. Rather than comparing that to ridership, we're comparing that to service hours. And um, as you can see here, the service hours have increased from FY14 through FY18. I believe uh, that's about a 9.8% increase overall in total service hours if you compare FY14 to FY18. And again, because of the resources that uh, Council has invested in the public transportation system, we've been able to improve our uh, frequency and our service accordingly. And speaking of frequency, this will give you an idea of uh, where, our, where our frequency is at. Um, in FY13, which is not on this graph, you'll recall we had some frequencies as, you know, as, as spread out as se every 75 minutes to every 90 minutes. In FY14, when we uh, implemented our system enhancements, we got that frequency down to an average of just under 36 minutes. Um, we then, um, in FY15, uh, again, added hours or frequency to the uh, system, got that down to just under 35 minutes. And we've been kind of stabilized at that 35 minutes because we've really been directing um, additional resources to night service rather than, you know, improving uh, frequency during the, uh, during the day. And, of course, with FY19, um, adding Sunday service even. So um, it's something we want to continue to work on. We'd love to have that frequency down uh, to where we're 30 minutes or less on average, um, continuing to work our transit service analysis plan, which really uh, suggests we have several 15-minute uh, corridors or 15-minute routes, but we will continue to, to work our plan in that area. And then this next slide will just give you a sense um, in, like, an example of the resources required to go ahead and bring uh, that frequency down to 30 minutes. Uh, we'd look at adding, uh, for example, three buses, be an additional 651 miles, uh, and give you a sense of the additional operating cost. Um, just to, again, I thought I would include this slide just to put it in perspective and that, you know, it, it does take a considerable amount of resources to continue to uh, reduce that, or I should say improve that frequency. And so with that, I'll be glad to answer um, any questions. Jason, just a comment, if you don't mind. I know sure. it's very complicated to move bus stops, and I want to thank you so much for relocating the stop to outside the day shelter and the resource center. Yep. That has been a really significant uh, improvement, quality of life for those folks that use that bus route. Right. Thank you. Well, I, I believe as you were speaking, the city of Moore just unanimously passed the RTA, and last week the... Midwest City, I think, unanimously passed. So that's it. Everybody has now passed that, and we're done. Um, an RTA was born while you were speaking, is what he's saying. I think. <laughs> <laughs> the, the what? I said an RTA was born while he was speaking. Yeah, I believe well, that's a passage uh, by the final <laughs> council. Thank you for sharing that, council. <laughs> yeah, very uh, exciting. Can you remind me on electric buses where where you guys are? What are your thoughts in terms of capital investments in electric buses? Yeah, well, we are, um, we are in the process of procuring a single electric bus, really, to begin starting a pilot program. We were, we were approved uh, for an FTA grant to allow us to do that. And, um, you know, we're kind of, um, we're going to do it as a pilot program. We have certain routes we've identified, particularly the downtown circulator, where we think the electric bus will make sense. Um, we're still a little bit concerned about the range. Um, that some of the electric buses would offer and how that would complicate operations in terms of recharging them. Um, so I guess the answer is we, we are looking into it. We're going to launch a pilot program and we'll kind of see where we go from there. So when would we procure that first one? Uh, we're, we're probably a year out on actually receiving the bus. I anticipate actually um, placing the order within the next a few months, I mean 60 to 90 days probably. Um, one of the things we're looking at with this electric bus is, um, you know, not just the electric propulsion technology, but we're also trying to take advantage of, since this is going to be kind of a one-off bus from our fleet, we're also looking at options for different flooring, different seating, you know, just being able to kind of test the market. So it's taken us a little while to put the specs together, but we're trying to be as strategic about it as we can.
Okay. And how about finally just a bus shelter investments in the next one to two years? Well, in terms of numbers, I mean, our, you know, our goal is to, uh, our LFR goal is 25 shelters per year. And I can tell you that um, right now we have about 45 locations that the, con the concrete work is all done. The shelters are ready to be installed. We had some shelters on back order in the last fiscal year that kept us from getting them all uh, put up. But we're working on that diligently. And again, our goal is 25 a year. We've okay. been able to actually exceed that the last few years, but that would be our minimum. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, I think that concludes all of that. <coughs> Anything else to say, Craig? I just want to thank everyone for I'm sorry. I just want to thank uh, the City Council for the opportunity to serve you all and serve our residents and just say that um, even though I'm kind of in an interim status right now and growing out with, you know, with Jim, I just appreciate the leadership that we have with our elected officials and the way you all work together and lead us as an organization. We've got a great organization, a great city team of leaders with our assistant city managers, our department heads, and really leaders throughout the organization. I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. I feel blessed. Uh, I believe that God brings people into your lives to help build you and to make you, and there's so many people who've invested in me through the years, people that I've worked for, that I've worked with, that even I've managed, that have taught me so many things, and I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to continue to work with them in a new role and with this great team, and uh, just looking forward to the great things that we get to do as a city. So thank you all. Thank you. We're, we're excited for our shared future, and uh, yeah, you're, you're There'll be a little more pomp and circumstance in the in the weeks ahead, and uh, especially when you take office officially on January second at 5:01. So, um, all right, uh, that concludes city manager reports, claims, and payroll. You can find uh, on the website where the agenda is. That brings us to citizens to be heard, item 13, uh, and we had uh, two people who signed up, and then we'll open it up to anyone else who's here. Naquilin Jackson. Oh, that was you. Okay, great. This is your moment. So come forward, and uh, if you would try to limit your remarks to uh, three minutes or less. Uh, and you might pull that microphone down. To okay. Um, I wasn't for sure where I would direct uh, this concern. It has to do with the homelessness here in Oklahoma City and. Oklahoma areas where I've been, Shawnee and Oklahoma City. Um, and it's also considering the public transportation system. Public transportation system doesn't cover all of Oklahoma City area. The homeless population has increased. The shelters that be, I'm counting six on this list, I've only brought six, uh, eight copies, and I see there's nine folks here, um, council. But the ones that I'm looking at, it's only six. And um, from what I was told, that these Oklahoma City winter overflow beds was contracted through the city for the homeless. And so each one of these shelters designate the amount of beds that's available. Okay, these are not guaranteed. These are not certain. Um, once a person that's seeking shelter uh, uh, travel out to these various locations, uh, it's no guarantee the bed is available. And then considering the public transportation system, they might be having to walk back to, to another shelter to see if they're uh, availability. So Salvation Army has 90 beds. City Rescue has 40. Jesus House has 14. You know these numbers like this. Grace Rescue Mission has 20. Saint, the women's Development, known as Women's Development, um, has 20. And then the Susu Youth has 5. The, the homeless population have increased, and I have seen where people are sleeping outside up under bridges and what have you. This list was not available to the public, 
you know, just readily available. I got this list from someone else that was at a shelter, that works at a shelter. Okay, this list supposedly is up under their website. So most homeless people, such as myself, would not have access to it unless someone told us. Okay, so from what I'm understanding, there's no government oversight that these are nonprofit and uh, private uh, organizations. And their uh, policies, there's no, uh, there's certain length of stays. Some of them has went into programs and some of them is doing other things. And I think that there just needs to be a designated shelter, one designated shelter for people that are going through, for whatever situation it may be, that uh, the shelter is uh, welcoming to walk-ins. I uh, met a lady that had just been released from a hospital with a blood clot in her leg uh, with prescriptions, and the uh, public officials had dropped her off at the Salvation Army, and I suspect that she had to get down on a weather mat uh, because they didn't have room, you know what I mean, in the shelter that you're there every day or whatever, that part. Ms. Jackson, we're at three and a half minutes, if you will. Yeah, I understand. So with that being said, I'm not sure if y'all are the ones who are overseeing the shelters or where can I be directed to to, um, to speak to or get, get some things resolved. Because I understand that there's director of boards at each of these organizations. But basically, the homeless sector is, is a problem. So... The public transportation system doesn't cover all these areas, and there's people that are homeless trying to get to, and some of them has been turned away. So I'm just trying to see what is your thought or what is, you know, what's, what's the position. Okay. Well, I know Jared Shannon is here, uh, who, who helps the city on, on homeless issues. As you're, you, you do correctly identify that a lot of the homeless services in our city are provided by the nonprofit sector, but we do have some interaction, and we fund some of it here at the city level, but I know Jared would be happy to visit with you, um, you know, uh, after the meeting or, or outside and maybe get into more depth with your, with your questions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, because, uh, and, and I see the three minutes, but uh, Mayor five. David Holt, uh, we want to acknowledge all the people in these borders. Mm -hmm. So all people are not, you know, they're going through for whatever, and there's mentally and there's so on and so forth. So. Oh, absolutely. No, okay. this is an important issue on a lot of minds right now, and, and I'm in a meeting every couple of days on the homeless issue, and, and we're very conscious of, of the need for more shelters, especially low-barrier shelters. So, and I know Councilwoman Sawyer, pretty much everybody on up here is yeah. very engaged in this issue. Um, we just, yeah, we've just relied on a long time in Oklahoma City on the nonprofit sector, and, and maybe, maybe it's time for a larger commitment. This council did vote for basically doubling our investment in the Homeless uh, Alliance earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and I think those conversations continue. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ronnie Kirk. Ronnie, even though you're a regular, if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address again and trying to keep it uh, to three minutes. My name, is, <clears throat> me. My name is Ronnie Kirk from 2328 North Missouri from Ward 7. The reason I come to City Council this, today is right before y'all built a beautiful park on 16th and Martin Luther King. It's really nice. Walking trail, water park. Uh, the scenery is beautiful. Right before the weather started changing, I took my grandkids and Emmanuel, and we went down to the park just to enjoy the park. After we were there for a little while, my grandbaby came over to me and said, Paul, Paul, where do we use the restroom at? Kind of looked around and had no restroom. But with today's laws, if I'm go behind a tree 
to urinate. Police came through. I get an indecent exposure ticket. If kids are playing in the park, I'm listed as a pedophile the rest of my life. On the park at uh, Pitts Park, if teenagers are there playing basketball after the park closed, just enjoying the rest of the evening, if one of them teenagers have to go to the restroom, they'd have to go up to 7-Eleven to use the restroom. No restroom than most of the parks on the northeast part of town. After the facilities closed, there's no place other fit for the teenagers, the older people, the kids to go use the restroom. The park is the parks over there, they're nice. No restroom though. With today's laws and the, we're trying to develop the, all the city, not just part of it. We want to grow with the city too. So we, are, what I want for the northeast side of town and our needs is two different things. What we need is some of the small changes for the northeast side of town. And therefore we can grow with the city. Well, we need some of these small changes first. We need some restrooms over there. If one of y'all took, went over there to the park, and took a few kids with you, you ain't got nowhere to take them to the restroom after the, 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 the facilities close. So that's why I come to the council meeting today to speak on for Ward 7. I'm Ward 7 justice seekers. We want justice for some of the things that we should have had in the past. We want some of them in the future. Since we formed our little committee, it went from 10 people to 60. That's in eight weeks. The people there, they're from all over the city, they're all ages. They did a whole lot of things, but we have a whole lot of knowledge with, from the people that's on our committee. And they're all coming to me, Ron, what all can we do? I said, we're gonna do one thing at a time. As one person, I'm here today by myself, so they say, we know you can do it. And so it's like I'm the head, and they're all my backbone. They're going to keep me going forward, and I'm coming out here with the strength to speak to y'all to get some things we need done. And Emmanuel said, why do I like Pete White? I said, he used to fight for his. Ronnie, we're at four minutes, so I just want to wrap it up. His war. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Y'all have a good day. All right, you too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? If you wouldn't mind stating your, your name and keep it to three minutes. Okay. Teresa Leak. Um, I've been homeless too, but I'm staying at, you know, so I'm just like helping, taking my stuff one at a time. I'm just trying to find a job and what, you know, not look back, just look forward. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. And I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Teresa. All right. Well, that concludes our agenda. Uh, I am uh, flanked by two people celebrating their birthday tomorrow. So a happy early birthday to Francis and Craig. And uh, with that, we are adjourned.